Good day to you. In a few moments, you'll witness a conversation between Tenzin Rinpoche and author Andrew Holacek. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. The topic will be on dream yoga. The reason I'm uploading this is twofold. I've recently rebooted studying this aspect, and these are two of the best authors that I've come across. Uh, Tenzin Rinpoche wrote The Tibetan Yogas of Dream and Sleep, and Andrew wrote Dream Yoga, Illuminating Your Life Through Lucid Dreaming and the Tibetan Yogas of Sleep. You can find links to both of those books in the description below. The links are non-affiliate links, but if you're going to start looking into this subject, I can think of no better place than starting with these two individuals. So it was a real pleasure to come across this video, and I'm mostly uploading it for several of my friends. Now, my interest in dream yoga goes back perhaps 30, 35 years ago, where I was able to wake up in a separate reality um, between 10 and 12 times, and that reality is as real as this one, but also quite different in that you can move at the speed of thought. In that no teacher presented themselves to me at that time, I left it alone. And only now, like I said, did I find this aspect of Tibetan Buddhism deals with this subject. And with that, I would like to just let both uh, Tenzin Rinpoche and Andrew talk about dream yoga. Okay. <laughs> we are live. and always a little bit... Uh, um, technological problems always well uh, welcome to twr facebook live um, and uh, and also i wanted to welcome our special guest um andrew uh holicek did i pronounce okay you did thank you okay good <laughs> so uh, and also welcome all our um uh, Cyber Sangha members. So I hope that uh, all of you are having uh, wonderful experiences of lucid dreaming. And I've been reading the uh, comments on uh, my Facebook and I see many, many beautiful comments. So I wanted to thank everybody to, uh, for sharing your um, beautiful comments and your experiences. And also I see uh, that uh, number of people are also having lucid dreamings and also feeling some impact uh, during the daytime. So uh, very, very happy to hear that. So, so here, so I wanted to go ahead and please, Andrew, if you can uh, just introduce yourselves a few words and then we will begin to, you know, move on with the interesting conversation here. Yeah, that'd be great. Well, first of all, Rinpoche, thank you so much for inviting me. It's really an honor and a privilege to spend this time with you and your cyber community. Um, yeah, I mean, my, my kind of nocturnal journey has been a large part of my life for, at this point, over 40 some years. Um, but there was one point in particular that maybe worth sharing that was a tipping point for me, you know, kind of a classic before and after experience where in my early 20s, um, as I was actively engaged and at that point what was called the developing new age i i somewhat spontaneously um dipped into a, a a state of consciousness for about two weeks where um i was having just spontaneous lucid dreams virtually all the time every night and just as provocatively for me um, is my experiences during the day became increasingly dreamlike um and for the first week or so is highly entertaining, um, you know, inconceivably profound for a young man. But what became somewhat disconcerting that we could perhaps talk about in relationship to how these practices tie into the central teaching on emptiness is that at a certain point, um, it became increasingly difficult for me to actually distinguish between night and day when I was dreaming or when I was awake because my dreams were becoming increasingly real my daytime experience was increasingly de-reified, more illusory, until they both became somewhat indistinguishable. And because I, I didn't have the psychic infrastructure to understand what was happening, 
what was originally a very um, refreshing, um, perhaps even a glimpse of awakening experience became progressively disconcerting. And I basically started to freak out because I was losing my sense of ground. And then it turned out to be an extraordinary blessing in disguise because after I um, kind of closed the experience down, it really catapulted me into my spiritual pursuits. And uh, by process of elimination, I started reading about Buddhism and was immediately struck by the word origin and etymology of the word Buddha, which means the awakened one. And so all I was like, well, what awake as opposed to what? And the more I read it about Buddhism, the more I was just nodding my head. And I said, well, maybe I'm a Buddhist. And then when I finally came across the teachings on um, Tibetan dream yoga, I really felt like I had come home. And so for me, Rinpoche, for the last 40 years, um, this incredible dance between diurnal and nocturnal um, has been a real just exhilarating path for me. And I have pursued it with rigor and delight for these many decades um, and try to share with others as best I can the extraordinary elegance and just the, the potentialities that await for us every single night. I, I have the image that we're sleeping on top of this vast natural resource that goes untapped every single night. Um, and like you said earlier in one of your programs, you know, we spend up to a third of our lives lost in the oblivion of sleep. And so for me, it's been an exhilarating ride that I'm now so blessed to share with others of how to take advantage of this otherwise lost period of time to bring it on the path of psycho-spiritual transformation. Sure. So, yes, wonderful. So I think, uh, <clears throat> you know, now we have been, um, all the, our cyber sangha has been practicing uh, last couple of weeks on a dream and before we have been practicing quite a bit on a sleep. So I think the community here in our cyber sangha is kind of very engaged and uh, and I think um, we have been emphasizing a lot and at the end of the day, I think it's so much about making the bridge between yeah. day and the night yeah. or or night to the day. So basically this cycle if there is no connection between this cycle, there is no dream yoga practice. There yeah. is no sleep yoga practice. There is no pardo practice because the, if there is no connection or able to build that connection, it seems like very similar to our, you know, everyday very simple thing in our life that if you 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 have to be open to something, you have to have an idea about something, you have to have fire to manifest those mm -hmm. idea you have some kind of discipline to be consistent in uh, doing what you do until it manifests. Making bridge between all each of these things are fundamental f in order to have some fruition. So I think I'm just reminding again to everybody saying, your day is your preparation for night. If there's no connection, the enthusiastic, like, a, like a, that fire, that drive, that inspiration, that consistency uh, to, you have to have that in order to kind of make the bridge. So I think that's kind of a reminder for everybody. Yes. And uh, so maybe, maybe please go ahead, maybe Andrew, if you can maybe talk a little bit about um, the dream yoga as benefit, dream yoga and sleep yoga benefit, a physical, uh, physical benefit, psychological benefit, yeah. spiritual benefit, maybe these, um, how you see the ben benefit uh, of these practices? Yes, well, as you well know, um, it's the, the benefits are almost um, too good to be true. And, and I'm doing research for two follow-up books right now. So I'm diving deep into this material. And I really don't think it's an exaggeration to say that lucid dreaming, dream yoga, let alone sleep yoga, really truly represents the, the pedagogy or the education of the future. And I think when induction methods are refined, which is the great contribution of the West, um, the, the opportunities are unparalleled. And so the physical, psychological, spiritual benefits are really extraordinary. And I can just give a, the briefest sense here um, because there's so much to say. But one particularly provocative thing is that, um, you know, the brain cannot tell the difference between something that's imagined, dreamt, or so-called physically experienced. And so um, what happens is, of course, that when we dream, and studies have shown this, scientists have, have shown that, like, for instance, when you're singing in your dream, and there's a, an incredibly interesting YouTube video you can get about a German researcher, video 
of doing studies on a very talented lucid dreamer who actually learns how to play an instrument solely within the context of his lucid dream. It's very provocative. And so, so again, this is not just metaphysics. Studies have shown that if you're working with music or, or some kind of creativity, um, your right hemisphere is activated when you're dreaming, just as if you were doing so in life. If you're working on a mathematical, logical problem, and I'm not sure why anybody would do that in a dream, your left hemisphere is activated. And so using, um, Ruchi, as you know, with your, your fascination in science, using the tenets of neuroplasticity, that what you do with your mind affects your brain, you can literally change your brain by how you dream. Um, and this is no small thing. It's, it's a profound way to go to a kind of night school, as I refer to it, that gives us this increased opportunity to work with our mind at the psychological level. But the advantages don't just stop there. I, I think what may be particularly surprising to people is that there are also physical benefits. Um, sometimes it's called downward causation, that again, what you do with your mind affects your brain, also affects your body. And so there are also scientists that are doing very compelling research about how um, lucid dreaming can be used to help people with athletic performance. People with disabilities can engage in athletic performance within the context of their dreams and literally transform the way their body functions. Um, you can also work with dreams on, on a kind of therapeutic level. Um, and this is just a quick sidebar that I have used frequently in my experience that, for instance, if you're having a, an issue with someone, an interpersonal issue, and you, for instance, you were to go to a therapist to work with that issue, as many people know, the person you're having an issue with doesn't have to be there physically. They only have to be there phenomenally. They only have to appear to you mentally for the healing or resolution to take place. And so within the context of a dream, and Stephen LeBerge writes about this very beautifully, that you can, um, in the powerful lucid dream, you can actually do therapeutic role play within the context of your dream. And this also includes with uh, someone who has died because death is the end of a body, it's not the end of a relationship. So unresolved relationships um, can be purified, resolved in your dream because the person appears to you in the dream state, they appear to you phenomenally, that's enough. Yeah. Um, and then of course, from there, we, we, I'll, we can talk so much about the spiritual benefits, which is the charter of your program. The spiritual benefits, as you know, are, are truly off the charts. And as you, in my um, tradition as a student of Kagi Buddhism, you know, the first Karmapa, His Holiness Chusam Kempa, allegedly attained his full-blown enlightenment through the practice of dream yoga. So the potentials are, are boundless, and it's one reason I am so thrilled to be diving deeper and deeper into this material to share this extraordinary opportunity that we have every single night when we go to sleep. Wonderful. Yeah, so, so basically that what you're saying is that every... Uh, appearances in a dream, every person, every situation, uh, every context, whatever ex stories, what's happening there, it looks like somehow it's happening in your mind, but it's a, in a, at the same time, it's real as yes. awakened life. It's, it's experiences are real as awakened life. But if you're able to change any of them um, in your dream, through your lucid dream, the impact, yes. the development, transformation in your life is equally the same. So, same. So, basically, yes. so, basically, so basically. And if I might interject, I might interject it's, it's even it's, more it's even more I'm having an echo here. Hopefully this will go away. Um, Namkai Nobu Rinpoche, the great Nyingma master, who's taught and written extensively on sleep and dream yoga, he once said um, that the practices that we accomplish in our dream state are up to nine times more effective and transformative than what we're doing in the waking state. And for me, the somewhat um, outrageous proclamation makes tremendous sense because when I look at my experience around this, and I can share some st um, stories with myself and others who have come to me, it's as if when we're engaging with these subtle dimensions of mind, we're working, the analogy I use, Rinpoche, is it's almost as if we're working with the tectonic plates of our experience. And so what we do down there has a massive effect on what happens up here, so to speak. So as we know, when literal tectonic plates just shift a few inches or meters, the surface implications can be profound. And so when Rinpoche, when, when um, Namkai Noru says, 
practices that we accomplish in the night can be up to nine times more effective. I don't think this is a, an exaggerated or hyperbolic claim because in my understanding of the strata or dimensions of mind, and even Freud would say, you know, backstage runs on stage, yeah? Um, scientists have shown that about 95% of what we do in our so-called conscious lives are actually dictated by unconscious processes. And this is what it means to be asleep in the spiritual sense. It's even like Christ once said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And so in lucid dreaming dream yoga, it's that beautiful, unique state of consciousness, sometimes referred to as a hybrid state of consciousness, where the conscious mind can face the unconscious mind directly, point blank. And so instead of working with the, the leaves and branches of your experience, which would be classic self-help psychotherapy, even um, entry-level meditation practices, with these nocturnal meditations, as I've come to understand them doctrinally and experientially, we're not working with the leaves and the branches or even the trunk, we're working with the roots of our experience. And, and to me, I'll, I'll say one thing and then we can talk about this. I believe, and I can discuss from my own experience, that when people have hyperlucid dreams or they have a, a clear, unmediated experience of um, sleep awareness, it's not too dissimilar to what happens when people have a near-death experience. And by this, what I mean is that people can come back from a near-death experience and they can transform their entire lives. One event can change the trajectory of their entire lives. And I, I would argue that that's because they've touched something so foundational, so true, so direct, so awake, that it can shape shift the entire movement of our waking life. And I believe, and I have to say in my own experience, this is why I'm so passionate. When you have a hyper lucid dream, a dream that's more real than waking reality. When you wake up from that dream, this appears to be the dream. That's a game changer, that shifts, shifts everything. And so that's why, again, we have to be careful not to market it too much to hype it. But there's a reason the traditions and the scientists are now saying that the rapid opportunities for psycho-spiritual development every night are almost unparalleled. Um, and so that's why I'm so thrilled to have this opportunity to share this with you and your community. Because yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I think uh, maybe <clears throat> uh, um, one of the students on the Cyber Sangha Jenny asked a question about you know what, what is uh, beyond like a, like a, it's a fun to have a lucid dream. Right. He asked what was what is the kind of purpose. Maybe I just say a few words, yeah. Jenny, um, or all the Cyber Sangha is you know. According to the teaching, uh, so first of all, the idea of dream, when we talk about, when we say dream, for, for us, there is some sense of notion of dream is not real. And uh, uh, what is real, it's more problematic for us. You know, uh, I just sometimes say, you know, whenever you say something is real, something is serious, it has more potential to create suffering. Mm -hmm. And dream is considered as something that's not real. So if the dream becomes used sometimes as a metaphor to explain something deeper, the truth of reality. And so, so, so when, when, we, when we develop these different, through different techniques, a developing a lucid dream, as Andrew says, once you have a lucid dream, you begin to see experiences of your night um, and you, you are conscious of them, that basically means you, are, you know you're dreaming. That basically means you have control, you have the power, you can guide, you can change, you can transform. In a dream yoga practice, in a Maju teaching, it talks about the dream goddess is called Juma Chimbo, like a miracle, the mother of miracle, miracle goddess. The notion of miracle goddess, the magical miracle, or illusory, it basically means it's changeable. Yeah. You can change. You don't need to, to be stuck in, in the reality, what you have created with your ego and your conditions and your pain. You don't have to be stuck in that reality. The reality that you perceive can be totally changed, transformed. So basically, uh, this is it's, lucid dreaming is about not only uh, just to have fun, but go beyond and transcend your conditions 
and trans and transform your sufferings and and benefit uh, or re or reconnect with your potentiality and benefit yourself and others so it's a, some sense of a freedom that's really like a spiritual sense of freedom awakening and able to um connect with the highest aspect of yourself that is still fun but more than just fun and able to manifest highest aspect of yourself what we call tinle enlightened activity that is also fun just more than ordinary samsaric fun yeah. so i think that's that that are the main purposes of um of lucid dreaming so maybe maybe you maybe you might want to say some some things about it yeah thank you rimbache yeah i think there are several things when when i make the my distinction between lucid dreaming and dream yoga and it's a very common question what is the relationship one of the ways i define it and i think you were suggesting this is that in so many ways lucid dreaming um it, it certainly at its entry levels is entertaining it can be um psychologically transforming and that sort of thing i i like to refer to lucid dreaming altogether at its apex as um, practices for self-fulfillment dream yoga which transcends but includes lucid dreaming in other words it includes lucid dreaming but it goes beyond it is more about purposes of self-transcendence and so instead of using your mind as a video game as you might in lucid dreaming you're using it as a laboratory um, a way to explore the nature of mind and reality and i think it's very interesting that in so many lucid dreaming programs and and even the gadgetry these days they never say in the small print um that whenever intention is involved karma is created and so whether you know it or not you're working with karma i.e habit in your dreams and so if you're in a lucid dream and your intention is to indulge your lucid dream which most people do initially there are karmic repercussions so with uh, dream yoga you're not creating negative karma you're creating positive positive karma i.e good habits or you're working to transform and purify karma all together um and so i couldn't agree more with you that the the great joy of these practices is that you're working to develop a malleability a flexibility in fact there's a, a playful jingle here at rinpoche that says you know blessed are the flexible for they are never bent out of shape and so we suffer in direct proportion to how solidly we take the contents of our mind and our reality and i sometimes playfully say that if there was an original sin in buddhism and of course there isn't but if there was i would argue that that original sin is reification the sin of making things real um and i invite people always to take a look when your life is really heavy it's kind of the endarkened view not the enlightened view we suffer when we take the contents of our experience to be to be so real and so in my experience working with these these nocturnal meditations for decades um it's almost as if we're, we if we could carefully say we're we're so to speak reifying the contents of the dream state we're making we're paying greater homage to the validity of our dreams as a way to de-reify our waking experience um and as is you so beautifully write in your book Rinpoche that i think people always need to remember that when you're working with your dreams in dream yoga what are you really doing what are dreams made of well dreams are just made of your mind it's just your mind expressing itself in this more distilled um refined state and so when we're engaging in these practices of transformation transmutation self liberation you know the stages the classic stages of dream yoga practice we are working to transform our mind as it expresses itself in the medium of our dreams and so it's the same mind expressing itself in a different environment and steven leberge says this beautifully you know he says waking consciousness is dreaming consciousness with sensory constraint dreaming consciousness is waking consciousness without sensory constraint it's the same mind mm -hmm. and so by working with it at this more foundational tectonic level again the great extraordinary benefit is you can affect profound transformation relatively quickly and and when you read the literature as i'm doing now it's really extraordinary how many testimonials and these are from from lucid dreamers and the liter spiritual literature is replete with um kind of spiritual testimonials how many people's lives have been transformed um in one night from a powerful dream 
So. Wonderful, yeah. So I think, uh, you know, um, uh, many uh, of uh, people in the Cyber Sangha here, I think uh, I've been encouraging everybody to share, like I, I read a number of them, that people, you know, um, able to feel the impact of the practices during the daytime, they're making a better connection between the day and night, having some glimpse of experiences of the uh, lucid dreaming. So I think the wonderful things about here is just this infinite yeah. possibility, infinite possibility, because um, something that we feel like I don't have a time, I don't have a time to reflect, I don't have a time to think, I don't have a time to go to therapies, I don't have a time to meditate. Your, our day becomes so busy, so occupied by a lot of things, but the night right. is still available for our transformation. So I think uh, the, the dream and also both sleep, uh, so important part of our uh, well-being, physical, yeah. psychological, emotional, and, and people who believe in enlightenment. Uh, if, you, if you don't have a time during the daytime to practice, right. You have all night to practice. Yeah. So uh, I don't know how many, 10, 15 years, 20 years, 30 yeah. years of sleep. So you, we have so much possibility. Maybe you, maybe you might want to say something a little bit about also sleep because I think new, like a neuroscience, you know, like they're talking about how important is sleep, for example, yes. where it's sleep become, playing a very important role of uh, clearing w waste and yes. uh, people who don't uh, sleep enough, for example, uh, average teenage people needing nine hours of sleep now, most mm -hmm. of the time during school time, getting only five, six hours of sleep. And people who are, you know, uh, with staying on a screen and turning on the light and not getting enough sleep and getting like five hours of sleep, but you're basically right. uh, not getting enough sleep, not getting enough rest, that basically means uh, purification of right. the brain, uh, uh, clearing of the waste is not happening. They say if that that's not happening, there's a chances of uh, Alzheimer's disease. That's right. Even more chances are there. So can you please say yes. more about that? Yeah, I mean, in my own clinical work, I work I deal with this, and it's extraordinary that um, people often don't realize that sleep is a lifesaver. Without sleep, you would die. And there's a rare, actually, genetic disorder called fatal familial insomnia that tends to occur in middle age. And once it occurs, it always ends in death. And it's a, a very unfortunate condition where people literally lose the capacity to sleep. And in so doing, eventually, they die. And so when we sleep, as you were saying, Rebecca, we, we, we go through um, five different phases of sleep. And it's perhaps a wee bit beyond our scope now to discuss these five phases. But I do recommend people study these phases because they help us understand the kind of the trajectory of the mind as it moves in and out of sleep. Um, and this also can be very informative for people who engage in extensive meditation and they're sitting and it's hot and their belly is full and their mind starts to drop off. And instead of just capitulating to that, that synambulance, we can actually, with an understanding of the stages of sleep, bring a heightened sense of lucidity, i.e. awareness, to actually what happens when we're on the meditation cushion. But from a purely physiological point of view, um, you know, we have these two classic stages of sleep, as you well know. Um, Non-REM sleep is the, big, the great restorative sleep. This is the sleep that dominates the first part of the night. This is where human growth hormone is released. This is where all the restorative regenerative processes take place. And it's very interesting, Rinpoche, that as we age, Aging, um, the, the, the amount of time we spend in non-REM sleep, restorative sleep, decreases as we age. And so now science is suggesting that a large part of the actual aging process is really brought about by uh, the, um, the diminution of time we spend in this deep um, restorative sleep. Um, there are some 72 a um, million Americans alone that suffer from sleep disorders. There's some 73 classified sleep disorders in the literature. I work specifically with things like sleep apnea. And so, yes, you know, it's like um, not only from a psychological or spiritual point of view, but also from a physical point of view, 
the elegance of these practices is larger in scope than just working with body uh, with spirit and mind. It's also working with body. And so we start, my understanding with working with this is we start to develop a more treasured honor relationship to what I like to refer to now as the temple of sleep. And um, I want to say one brief thing about this, Rinpoche, because it's very interesting to me that this is what I'm researching now in my current books, that if you look at the history of dream and sleep through uh, going back several thousand years, as you well know, many of the great wisdom ancient traditions, the Assyrians, the Egyptians, the Romans, the Hebrews, and, and the Greeks had a very honored, sophisticated relationship to the nighttime mind, so much so that it really kind of archetypally represented in the Greek healing temples of Asclepius, people would literally go into a healing temple. They would undergo fasting, ritual, supplication, purification practices in the effort to receive a, a dream from the divine physician. They would receive a dream and then they would heal. And so what happened, this is so interesting, Rinpoche, what happened through the dark ages as um, starting around the 14th century with a gentleman by the name of St. Jerome and then um, St. Thomas Aquinas and others, the church fathers in the dark ages appropriately named started to demonize the dream. In fact, uh, Hebrew texts were mistranslated um, and the dreams were, the dreams were come to be seen as the work of the devil. And so in a real a way, we were all kind of thrown out of the temple of sleep. And so what's so interesting is that, like, for instance, with Freud and, what, and Jung and the kind of reestablishment of honored relationship to dreams from the psychological level, these great individuals were not so much discoverers as they were restorers. And the reason I say all this is that I believe that one of the charters of these nocturnal meditations for each of us is to engage in a personal temple reconstruction project where we start to honor our dreams, we create a proper temple by working with our mind during the day, by working with classic good um, sleep hygiene from a Western scientific point of view, simple, very powerful techniques to restore this kind of environment or temple. We do so from a, from a spiritual point of view during inner yogic practices, um, prana purification practices and the like. So in so doing, every single night when we go to sleep, we can in fact restore and reconstruct our own temple of sleep, come to reinstate our homage to the sleeping mind. And a natural consequence of that kind of um, elevated, almost sacred relationship, the natural consequence of that is a heightened lucidity, not only in the dream state, but in the sleep state. Yeah, so I think uh, some sense uh, for all of us, so just basically very simple, value how important it is to sleep, yeah. how sleep is important, physical point of view, restoration, uh, healing, even for the brain, you know, needing for its uh, cl um, waste clearing, yeah. you know. So basically it's so important to see in a positive way that sleep is very important and look forward mm -hmm entering this sacred journey, the spiritual journey and a healing journey, looking forward that, and once you enter into that, the infinite possibility to find your true self, um, find your inner quality, exercise expressing this quality within your dream, that knowing it will have impact on your life. So I think that sense of, the valuing it, it's important. It seems Incredible. like kind of weird luck. I think everybody, I mean, I know like kids, you know, like my son who, who just, I don't know, maybe that when kids are like five, six, seven years old, eight, 10 years, nine, 10 years old, when they don't like to go to sleep, right? So <laughs> you, have, you have to, bad time, bad time, bad time, you have to keep reminding them. Right. And somehow one time, even my son told me, he said, it's a waste of time, you know. There's so yeah. much fun to just, just stay awake. Yeah. Yeah. So I think in some sense uh, of this relationship to sleep, yeah. feeling how important it is that we are losing some sense, you know. I mean, I remember yeah. personally for me also, you know, I truly see now a value to, to go to bed, basically, to just kind of looking forward to go to bed. Right. And uh, looking forward to saying goodbye to everybody. You know, I'm going, I'm going. You know? Exactly, exactly. It's very interesting, Rinpoche. I, I often playfully point out to people 
that, um, and this is a very interesting investigation, that, that whether we know it or not, and this is exactly what you're pointing to, we are all um, victims of a very insidious form of discrimination. Um, and by this, what I mean, and, it, and, and it, the worst types of discrimination are, are the ones that we don't even know we're afflicted by. It's like Mark Twain once said, it's not what you don't know that gets you in trouble, it's what you do know that just ain't so. Yeah. And what I'm saying here is that whether we know it or not, we all have a very powerful wake-centric prejudice. We believe that our entire experience, what we know of mind and reality, is purely dictated by what we experience in the waking state. This also parenthetically has a very deep connection to what's called sight centricity, how it is that our visual our, our, our eyesight literally dominates our other senses almost a hundred to one. I mean, a third of our brain, of our, our cortex is devoted to processing visual information. And so because of this discrimination, um, what happens is waking consciousness um, kind of colonizes and dominates other forms of consciousness it can't experience. Uh, so, it, you know, the waking consciousness, which is largely what? Egoic consciousness, yes? Ego loses its footing as it slips and falls asleep. And so when ego, i.e. what we call um, waking consciousness associated, falls into sleep and can't experience lucid dreaming, let alone lucid sleep, what does it do? It categorically dismisses it, just like science does in, in, when it goes bad in what's called scientism. And so in so doing, it's dismissing this vast opportunity for growth and development. And, I, and so I think what these practices do is they, first of all, they diminish wake centricity by developing this kind of um, profound sense of equanimity, one taste. It's like Milarepa once sang in one of his great songs, not seeing day and dream as differing, this is as meditation as it can be. Yeah. And so for the so equanimity, I think, is really one of the fruitions. Yeah, so basically, Again, you know, like our whole perception of reality is very dominated by experiences of awakened consciousness. And we have very little knowledge, trust, experiences of how powerful the night and the sleep and the dream can be. I think this is what whole purpose of the, the yogis in the past, exploring whole night, the dimension of whole night, how that is so important, and particularly if in the as the process of dying, it's only yes. place is that going to sleep, dreaming is yes. is the way to have experiences of death without yes. dying. Exactly, exactly. and uh, to have experiences of testing yourself if you were past moment of yes. the pardo without dying. Exactly. Once you die, if you fell, you fell. Yeah. But when you are sleeping, if you fail, you have another chance. Exactly. It's kind of way of really, like, really important. So I think uh, maybe, you know, that everybody knows the uh, Andrew's book is uh, titled Dream Yoga, Illuminating Your Life Through Lucid Dreaming and the Tibetan Yogas of Sleep. So this is your, the title of the book, right? Correct. So, thank you. Thank you, Rinpoche. So you yeah. can uh, find everywhere on Amazon and so on. So uh, anything else that you feel like you wanted to kind of touch here today? I think maybe one last thing, Rebeche, especially since you connected it to the Bardo teachings. Um, you know, my, my, my experience of the nighttime practices really came to life when I started um, writing and teaching on the Bardos. And two things happened in both studies, both Bardo yoga and um, sleep and dream yoga. And that is that I used to have kind of a linear view of consciousness, you know, um, on in the morning, off at night, online in the morning, at the end of the line when you die. And so we you know, had this kind of linear view. Um, and so what both Bardo Yoga and Sleep and Dream Yoga did for me is they replaced this linear view of consciousness with a circle or a spiral. And that is that it's not just mind coming in and then going off. Um, it's more like what these practices do, both Dream and Yoga and Bardo Yoga, is they replace the Western view of consciousness that's like this on-off light switch it's as if we replace that with a dimmer. And so instead of going on and off, lucid, non-lucid, dead, alive, wake, asleep, what these practices allow us to do and these, the subtle dimensions of the meditations are designed to meet the subtlety of the mind as it descends into these states, 
it's as if we, we take the dimmer and we keep a few photons of lucidity on. And so instead of falling into deep, dreamless sleep um, uh, ignorantly or dying ignorantly, these practices allow us to keep the light on. Um, the night light is left on. And so in that regard, we start to see the endless play, the delightful display of mind as it goes from gross to subtle to extremely subtle. It's not on, off, yes, no, black, white. It's basically this gradation from gross to extremely subtle. And the elegance of these practices is in fact to point out these subtle dimensions of mind, give us the meditations that allow us to become familiar, the literal definition, gom in Tibetan of these states, so that when they spontaneously reveal themselves as we sleep, dream, or die, instead of blacking out in a non-lucid death or a dream experience, we keep the light of awareness on. And that's in a certain sense what it means to um, accomplish these practices is I've come to understand that. We see the mind as it basically displays and dances through all these extraordinary dimensions of experience. Yeah, so basically, you know, like uh, in, the, in the Bion tradition, the Madha Tantra and the six yogas of Naropa, yeah. the principle is that the awakened consciousness, the, the pure mind, the nature of mind, it's always presence, yeah. omnipresence. The truth is omnipresence beyond time and space. Our connection to that, our awareness to that, we go on and off, switch, yeah. we switch on and off. But the, the truth doesn't change. The yeah. awareness, the essence doesn't change. The light is always there. So yeah. some sense of, yeah. uh, so that's why I think in a way, you know, not only dream and sleep, dream and sleep and definitely two different parts of it. When we are sleeping, uh, our ignorance uh, switches off the clear light. When we are dreaming, our emotions and thought switches off yeah. uh, the, the clear light, but they don't have to. When we are afraid, our fear switches off the light and conf light of confidence but they don't have to. Mm -hmm. uh, when we are, any negative emotion arises, it just basically, it switches off that. So in, so that that's why I think in some sense of all the different practices come is just because each is like an antidote for each different situations, you know? Exactly. Pardo, poa, chu, the element practices, they are equally important in how they switch off and off like a dream and sleep. So it's like a, so it's like a, it's a, it's a fascinating whole, yes. all these point of views, no? Yes, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And, and you, you said something, Rinpoche, that's very compelling to me, and I would love to hear your um, thoughts on this. And, and I think that, to me, there's two ways to look at lucid dreaming. Um, and one is that lucid dreaming, the more relative way, is that lucid dreaming is something that we have to train in. We have to engage in these practices and in the kind of relative kind of causal vehicle approach. But I think it's very compelling, and I'd love to hear what you think about this, that I think a more elegant way to look at lucid dreaming and, and lucidity altogether, because lucidity is just kind of a code word for awareness, is that lucid dreaming is actually the natural type of dream. And that what's really happened is that we have been unwittingly trained by our culture, by our society. We've been trained into non-lucidity. And so by understanding the enemy, as it says in, in Sun Tzu's classic, The Art of War, if you know your enemy, then in a tantric way, you can transform that enemy into your friend. But the reason I mentioned this, Rinpoche, and I'd love to hear what you think, is that from an absolute perspective, the only thing we really need to do, and, and I, I argue that this is the irreducible instruction, uh, the best instruction for death, the best instruction really for the entire spiritual path, is really summarized in one word, and that is just relaxation. Relax into the already open, lucid state of mind. And then, of course, lucid dreaming is a natural consequence of that relaxation. And I think as spiritual practitioners, I believe this is important to understand because we have the relative approach working with the laws of karma and habituation, absolutely deep homage to that. But on one level, it's like Twink Rinpoche once said, striving is the only obstacle. On one level, the only thing you have to do and as, as human beings, 
I mean, I should say as human doings, human being is very difficult. The only thing we have to do is open and relax. Yeah. Um, in that regard, lucidity naturally dawns from that more Dzogchen point of view with the nocturnal practices. And this is why- Resting, I pre- um, resting is a beautiful word. I think everybody loves it, but when people rest, they fall asleep. Right. <laughs> so they have, to, they have to learn how to rest properly. Yeah. You know, the notion of rest is always like an ego is trying too hard. Ego, I'm talking to ego to rest. When ego rests, it falls asleep. It doesn't allow the awareness to arise. Right. So, so I think it's a, resting is an easy thing to say, right. but not necessarily easy to, to, to experience aware and especially giving the space to awareness to arise in the, in, in the moment of resting. It's, I think, in the key of resting, because usually resting means uh, no awareness for some people. Right. So, so anyway, so thank you so much. I think we are running out of time here and uh, we appreciate your time and thank being you. with us and sharing your knowledge, your experiences. Thank you. And I'm sure everybody benefit very much from this and the people who are continuously interested that, you know, you can get Andrew's book and uh, and find where Andrew is. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity, Ramachay. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye.